This is the Sidecast by MD Edge. I'm the voice of MD Edge podcast, Nick Andrews. And welcome to episode 134 of the Sightcast by MD Edge. I am Nick Andrews. We hope you and yours had a happy and safe Labor Day holiday. If you're listening to this on our podcast feed, let's check out what we've got coming up in this episode. We welcome Dr. Peter Yellowlees, who is a physician out in California. He's a professor of psychiatry and chief wellness officer at UC Davis. And Dr. Norris and him, uh, the topic that they're discussing this week are changes to clinical practice that have been forced by COVID-19 and the pandemic and the likelihood that many of the changes are here to stay. We've all been talking about things like telemedicine and, and virtual medical meetings like APA, et cetera. The question is going to become what paradigms have shifted as a result of COVID-19 and what will we return to as soon as we possibly can. Dr. Yellowlees, of course, has a link in the show notes. You can click that link and read more about him. And of course, Dr. Jacqueline Posada writes our show notes, and she did a great job. The show notes include take-home points and some relevant links to topics that are discussed in this episode. Okay, so without any further ado, we'll get right into the episode. Uh, Remember, you can email the show at podcasts at mdedge.com. You can tweet at us at mdedgepsych. All right, please welcome Dr. Lorenzo Norris and Dr. Peter Yellowlees. This is Dr. Lorenzo Norris, Editor-in-Chief of MD Edge Psychiatry. Uh, Today, we are really privileged to have uh, Dr. Yellow Lees here to speak with us about something given the environment that we're in, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, Dr. Yellow Lees is gonna speak to us about telepsychiatry and really give us his thoughts and an update in terms of where we're at right now, what are some things that uh, practitioners can think about that should be on their mind and how we can continue to the best structure and customize our practices in this, I, I don't want to say ever-changing environment, but yeah, pretty much ever-changing environment. So Dr. Yellowlees, welcome to the MDH uh, Sitecast. Good. Well, thank you very much. So Dr. Yellowlees, um, I remember when um, telehealth or the idea of telepsychiatry like ages ago, like two years maybe <laughs> ago, we would talk about this and we put it out and we talk about it in terms of collaborative care models and uh, all types of things. Um, and there's been robust work done on this for probably uh, for quite some time. And you've clearly been a part of that. And then with COVID, I have to say it was, in my mind, somewhat amazing that we ramped up and did this with what seems like overnight. And now I would say telehealth and uh, telepsychiatry has become a big theme, not a big theme, but uh, if you're not doing it, uh, you'd be very hard pressed in this current environment to be reaching your patients. So it has now become somewhat of something that we rely on, something that's integrated in our care and our practice. So Dr. Yellowlees, can you tell me and or tell the audience in terms of your perspective and how you see the psychiatry using telehealth and what have you been seeing? Sure. Well, I mean, I think the reality of life is that telepsychiatry has come of age now um, and is really here to stay. And I think it's going to change the way that we all practice permanently. I think there's no question about that. Um, prior to COVID, uh, about one to 2% of all psychiatric consultations were taking place using telepsychiatry. Um, although uh, many of us have been predicting that would, there would be a lot more use than that. And in fact, I wrote plans about how, back in 2014 about the impact of pandemics and how, how that would actually change the use of telepsychiatry. Um, uh, unfortunately, you know, these things weren't uh, well planned for, but when the pandemic came, uh, actually the federal government was really very impressive and was ready for what happened and actually relaxed all the barriers and regulations that they had in place uh, that we'd been telling them about for the last 20 years um, and, and made it much easier for psychiatrists to see their patients uh, on video. Um, so I think this has been actually uh, you know, an essential, very positive move 
um, but has actually saved the, uh, both the many patients and kept their relationships going with their psychiatrists and has actually also saved many psychiatrist practices, quite honestly, um, and allowed them to carry on practicing uh, in a time when uh, other physicians, particularly in primary care, have actually gone bankrupt. I would, I would agree with you, Dr. Yalis. I wanted to actually uh, go back to something that you just said and even work our way up to the future, because you mentioned before that you had written a paper in, in, regarding the use of telepsychiatry or telehealth in the context of a pandemic in 2014. I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about what went into you writing that paper and why you decided to write it. It said you did do that and that you were thinking about that in 2014, but what, what led you to write that paper? So I've been uh, involved with the American Telemedicine Association for many years, and I was actually the president during 2017. Now, that's a big association with about 10,000 members and, I know, hundreds of companies. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so we've always looked at, you know, where were the likely sort of business models and, it, and, and situations that might occur where the use of uh, video and also a range of other digital technologies, particularly home monitoring, um, mm -hmm. would, would be needed. Um, and in fact, this actually goes back uh, to Katrina. Uh, I was involved in a process uh, with Katrina uh, where we looked at how we could have used uh, telepsychiatry much more effectively to, to help all of the people who were abandoned in Katrina and you know, particularly the sort of poor and, 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 uh, and black and brown communities. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, the, and before that, I was actually involved in the SARS outbreak in, in Hong Kong looking at the same issue. So that, that goes back 20 plus years, thinking about how we could use digital technologies following some sort of pandemic or major disaster. Um, so, so for some of us, this was no surprise, unfortunately. Um, and uh, there has been a lot of thought and work gone into this over, the, over many years. Um, and uh, I mean, it's just, at one level, it's, it's sort of really good that we've been prepared and been able to switch so quickly uh, in a pandemic situation. At another level, it's very sad that it's taken a pandemic to make this happen. Yeah, absolutely, Dr. Yolis, absolutely. So on one hand, we are glad that people have, that we have been thinking about this and we've been ready for it. But on the other hand, it is sad that it took this much to make it happen, but you know what? That's how change works frequently. So it, it is what it is and we are where we are. Now, I, one of the things in, that I reflect upon in terms of uh, telehealth or telepsychiatry, but similar to many practitioners, I had to adjust my practice to a hybrid model uh, involving uh, telepsychiatry. The thing that I actually was a bit, if you will, surprised by was how many of my patients readily adapted to it. It was, was it a change? Yes, but it was not as, you know, you kind of have these cognitive distortions of gloom and doom and what's going to happen and how is this going to work and the person isn't in my office and I can't hear them, I can't feel them. And you know that, I, I mean, I, I consider myself an introverted person, except when I'm talking to my patients. And I, I, I like to like be in the same space with them. However, I would say that, again, again uh, given the current situation, I've been pleasantly pleased with what, how, you, how I've been able to interact with a number of my patients, particularly those that just are in, if you will, maintenance treatment. And I, and many of them have actually told me that, you know, doc, you know, how long is this going to continue? I'm like, well, I don't know, but to be perfectly frank with you, it's going to be hard to justify having you, the time, the expenditure, the parking, the this, the that, the other, for at least a certain cohort of my patients coming back uh, into the office of pandemic or no pandemic. And Dr. Yellow Lees, uh, could you talk to us a little bit about what maybe the future is going to hold for, again, maybe a bit of a hybrid model where you're, you're going to be utilizing telehealth and telepsychiatry in addition to seeing patients still what we are used to brick and mortar in person? Yeah, so I think, I think that's a really key issue. I mean, I've personally been working in a hybrid model myself for several years now. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, uh, all of the patients who you know get referred to see me specifically through the university uh, essentially have the option and have had the option for several years to see me uh, either in person or via video or both. Mm -hmm. um, so the same person at different times, depending on their convenience and their need and my convenience and my need. Um, and so I've been working in a hybrid way for a number of years, and we've written a lot about this. Uh, Jay Shaw and I wrote a textbook uh, on telepsychiatry 
uh, that was published two years ago that actually talks about this hybrid model of care as being the long-term model of care that actually most psychiatrists will start using. Now, the reason for that is really simple. It's because patients love this, and yeah. as you've discovered yourself. And, yeah. and patient satisfaction has always been immensely high with the use of video. Um, it's actually a more egalitarian process for patients. It's less intimidating. Um, mm -hmm. it, they don't have to come and wait, obviously. It's more convenient. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, they're in their own place. They're in their own uh, home or in many cases, um, and you've probably had the same experience. I yes. see a lot, of, a lot of my patients in their cars nowadays. Yes. Um, because the car is actually the convenient place that is private, um, yes. as long as they're not driving, obviously. And uh, and so, um, you know, I see the car as being almost the new therapy room. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so uh, it, it's actually, uh, you know, in some respects, a better process for the patient. The other thing that's nice is you can find out more about your patient. Um, yeah. by seeing them on video, because you can get them to show you around their home, to show you around yeah. their garden. You can talk to them about the paintings on the wall. You can check out what they've got in the fridge. You can see how they, how organized mm. or disorganized they might be by just looking around their house. Yes. Um, um, and uh, you can do all sorts of things on video, uh, essentially the return of the home visit um, uh, that, you know, some of us used to do many years ago in which we've stopped doing that. So I think there's a lot of advantages to seeing patients on video and the patients love it. The patients love see those advantages. We're the ones who've been slow. Right. That, I, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, depending on where uh, folks trained at, uh, I was fortunate, I, I trained at Mount Sinai uh, in New York City. There was a time, I, and depending on your training program, you still may have done home visits or actually visiting a patient in their home. And I remember as a psychiatric resident, there were certain patients that, you know, we did do home visits. And it's exactly as you said, when you actually get to see someone in their environment, it's a far different and powerful dynamic. And for many different reasons, you know, we like, you know, well, how would we do this? How would we like syst be systematic about home visits without being part of an assertive community treatment team or an ACT team or something of that nature or what have you? And I do, I, I like the way that you put it in terms of telehealth. If you think of it as the kind of the new modern way in which you can practice do a home visit, which is actually just harboring back to fine kind of old school standard of medicine, then that really gives us a way in which to, to, to definitely think about this. The other, and, and to embrace it, I would say. The, um, the other thing I, I wanted to just comment on that you, you mentioned in terms of this hybrid model that I have to admit, I was really struck by at times the, the increased level of intimacy and involvement that you can have with that because you are in many ways now going into a patient's home in, in, invited, I might say. And that's a very, 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 very powerful thing. Now, with this hybrid model, this is uh, the two, I'm going, I'm asked two questions with this. Um, first question is, um, I'm curious how you feel as though in the future, like psychiatric practice is going to develop, like for, to be more granular, I'm like, I wonder how much office space we're going to need. Like many of us practice, we have X, Y, or Z amount of office space. Um, but what we still require, I mean, you, you're not a prophet, but I mean, what we still require the same office overhead if we were to utilize this hybrid model? I think it's, we clearly won't. I mean, there's no question about that. I think many more of us are going to be practicing from home. Uh, I've practiced at home exclusively for the last uh, six months now, and I'm sure many other people watching this have done the same. Uh, and we suddenly wonder, why did we have that office? Um, yeah. You know, I think we need to have some process clearly for making appointments and notes and, you know, all of these sort of administrative aspects. Um, but actually, really, there isn't a great need to have an office, um, particularly for people in private practice. Um, and so I, I've, uh, I've actually asked the same question of many colleagues on different uh, calls like this. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just thinking from the last 40 or 50 people I've asked, literally, I've only had one person who said they're going to practice in exactly the same way as they used to before COVID, after yeah. COVID. So I think people are going to dramatically change their practices. And can I just jump into one, one other thing that you said a minute ago, which I think is really important, Dr. Norris, this issue of intimacy. Yes. Um, the, the, the sort of fantasy in the past for most psychiatrists has been that, that uh, seeing people on video will be sort of not as good as in person, mm -hmm. okay? I actually argue with many patients it's a lot better. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for that is that um, 
the patients on the whole actually can be more intimate on video mm. than they can in person, particularly when it's about topics that are stigmatized or embarrassing. So things like, um, you know, their sexuality, about uh, HIV, um, maybe about women who've been raped or, you know, where there's been trauma. Um, you know, it's not surprising, but in fact, with the little bit of extra distance you get on video, it's easier to actually um, talk more and to, to, to tell more. Uh, to the, the person you're speaking to. So we know that you can have very intimate conversations on video that are actually often easier to have for the patient um, than they would be in the office setting. And I've had many patients over the years who've you know, started seeing me on video and suddenly told me all this stuff on video um, mm -hmm. about you know, traumas and other issues that they've never told me in the office. Um, and they've sort of looked a bit surprised on occasions. Um, but but the, the other thing that comes into action, apart from this, this ability, the distance, is that mm -hmm. on video, people can be a little bit disinhibited also. Yes. Um, you know, yes. you just said yourself that, you know, you're sort of more extrovert. Um, yeah. and, uh, and I think we are a little bit sometimes. And that also actually enhances the relationship that you have with your patient um, and can actually enhance also the amount of information that you're able to transmit. You know, I think that's a very powerful observation, uh, not a powerful observation, but something that I've experienced. I would also be curious if um, our clinicians or our patients who were maybe part of a different generation, I, my bet is they would nod their head enthusiastically um, in regards to that added space at times, particularly with the correct relationship, giving an increased sense of security and allowing one to reveal more. So I would agree with you. Absolutely. That speaking of which kind of as a segue or, or as a transition in terms of really understanding the, the abilities of telepsychiatry and telehealth in general, as an educator yourself who's written a textbook, and I work with medical students and residents all the time, one thing that I think about right now is our training. And I certainly know that when I was trained as a resident, I did not go through any formal training in telehealth or telepsychiatry for that matter. And given where we're at, I would agree with you that telehealth in one shape or form or another is going to be here to stay. It just makes too much sense. Do you have any particular recommendations? Obviously, you've written a textbook, you and Dr. Shore. Uh, so, I mean, perhaps everyone should just read the textbook. But other than that, I mean, a simple thing, go out and buy the textbook. Um, but other than that, um, do you have any thoughts in regards to recommendations in terms of telepsychiatry for those in the educational community who are teaching medical students and residents for this new paradigm? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, first of all, at UC Davis, we have mandated that our residents do telepsychiatry now for several years. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we've put in place a, a relatively brief training uh, process for them. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that literally involves, as you said, reading the textbook. And in fact, one of the chapters in the textbook um, uh, is the one that we actually focus them on. And that's a, an entire chapter on clinical skills on video. Mm -hmm. um, and so, because you don't see that in general psychiatric right. books. <laughs> um, no, you don't. But in fact, you actually need to learn some simple media skills and how to actually present yourself and how to interact nicely with people. Um, so, um, so I think that's... So there is some essential reading, I think, that you need to do. Um, and then really the rest of it, we've just uh, in the past had, had uh, residents sitting in with me or with one of the other attendings when we're actually seeing patients. So we, we watch them do a patient or so first on, on telepsychiatry. But quite honestly, the residents are usually ahead of us. I mean, yeah. they, they use uh, video all the time uh, in their own personal lives. Um, it's no big drama for them. Uh, no. and, and quite honestly, most residents look at uh, people from my generation in particular and just think, you know, hey, why aren't we doing this much more? Um, because it's their norm. Um, so really the training for our residents nowadays, for people from the sort of Gen Z and millennial uh, <laughs> generations, um, is really actually no big deal. Um, the, the issue is, uh, is looking at what are the workflow processes. Yes. Um, and so, for instance, I supervise intakes all the time. So do other attendings in, at, at UCD. Um, and we just have uh, the patient is in their home, the resident is in their home, and we're in our home. Um, mm -hmm. And we have a process where the resident and the patient meet first. Uh, the resident then uh, emails or texts uh, the, the attending when they're ready. We uh, beam into 
uh, one of two different video systems and have a chat mm -hmm. with the resident by themselves. And then we go and meet the patient in whichever video system they're in and have a threesome um, and, and finish off the intake just in the same way as we might do in, in a normal training intake. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we're in three different homes using one or two different video systems and we just have a process that, that uh, we all understand and it works beautifully. Okay, fabulous. I wanted to comment on a couple, and I think that your outline, how you guys are doing it, or is exceptional. Um, one, I haven't looked at it in a while, but I'd be curious if the, I'm assuming, if the psychiatric milestones, if they're going to make any type of adjustments in regards to telehealth or telepsychiatry formally, um, that might be a little bit ahead of things. But the other thing in terms of this hybrid model that I wanted to give um, some additional um, acknowledgement to, uh, or the impact of telehealth, particularly in the realm of COVID, as a psychiatrist who practices in a hospital, whoa, it was not, a, it's talk about paradigm changing or transforming because of psych, of workforce issues, exposure and things of that nature, particularly during the early stages of the pandemic. Absolutely, telepsychiatry and telehealth gave us an opportunity to interact with our trainees as well as our patients in a way in which we just would not have been able to. So I did also want to bring that up in terms of telepsychiatry and my what I, I could have a whole hour-long discussion on just telepsychiatry in the hospital and right. the different ways in which you can use that, um, th that that all that information. And then the other thing I wanted to, because you got me thinking about it in terms of the generation, it made me think about my daughter, who is 14 years old and FaceTimes all the time. Apple, like, her and friends, all they do is tell of this side or the other. And to me, it's like, I mean, I don't, I'm 47. I don't consider myself that old, but still I'm like, whoa, why do you, isn't that like kind of like, how do you, why do you guys do that? And my daughter looks at me, why wouldn't you do it? So I agree with you completely, Dr. Uh, uh, Yellow Lease, that this next generation of clinicians, and I'm privileged to work with a lot of residence folks, this not, we just got to teach them the workflows. They, they, will, and they will naturally get some, and I love what you said about picking up some media skills, because that is, in, and yep. so that's a very useful thing. Now, we, folks like you and Dr. Shore and many others have worked for years to decades on this. We've got textbooks. We are getting an increasing body of knowledge. What can we do in terms of keeping many of the regulations that came into existence, whether it is in terms of uh, how telehealth is accessed, payment, reimbursement, what can we do to keep those regulations in place so that we can continue to have this as an option for us in the delivery of care? All right, well, so the, we've been doing a lot of work on this, you, you won't be surprised to hear, during the COVID situation. And um, the, uh, the American Psychiatric Association has really taken a lead on this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but there's a whole lot of other associations has been, have been lobbying, almost all of the, the professional medical associations mm -hmm. have been lobbying uh, the federal government. Um, and if people go to the uh, American Psychiatric Association website, uh, and look at the COVID resources there, you'll find a paper about exactly that, about what uh, regulations need to be uh, relaxed or kept relaxed uh, as we go forward. Um, and uh, there's a very detailed paper that, that you know, I've been one of the co-authors on that's been written by, the, uh, by several of the committees from the APA um, that is being used for lobbying. And I'd strongly advise anyone watching this to download a copy of that paper, send it to your local congressman, send it to your lobbying groups, send it to your colleagues. Um, and, uh, and it goes through a, a series of uh, essentially seven steps, uh, mm -hmm. seven types of regulations that need to be both enhanced and maintained um, uh, post COVID. Um, so a lot of detail in it, but, essentially, but in brief, what, what, they, uh, what they involve is uh, maintaining the changes, changes to our licensing so okay. that we can see patients in other states um, and not be restricted to one state at a time. Uh, it, uh, it, it involves continuing changes of, in reimbursement so that we can see patients uh, on the phone as well okay. as on video and potentially on texting and using other techniques as well, which, you know, the reality is the new generations are using all the time. Absolutely. Um, uh, and, uh, and then thirdly, and very importantly, changes on prescribing, so that we can, can, we can prescribe controlled substances over video, uh, things like stimulants and, and benzodiazepines in particular, as well as buprenorphine uh, for addiction. 
Um, so so there's, a, there's those three areas, licensing, reimbursement and prescribing, all of which had very um, you know, difficult barriers uh, of a regulatory nat nature prior to COVID. All of those barriers have come down. And mm -hmm. it's really vital to keep those barriers down so that we can continue to practice it, quite honestly, in a much more patient-centered way, as we do now, um, see people in their homes and continue to follow people up more easily. Well, I thank you so very much for that overview, Dr. Yellowlees. Now, we were talking about telepsychiatry, telehealth, uh, but I wanted to, since you did mention it in your intro, I just wanted to bring it up and maybe get your thoughts on this, because you're also Chief Wellness Officer, right. if I heard you correctly. Right. Um, do you have any advice or thoughts? I mean, it, at this point in time, I'll tell you kind of what we're facing here at, uh, in my institution at GW, and I'm sure it's similar across the country. Um, clinicians have been working nonstop, many of them very long hours in the context of adjusting to a COVID-19 pandemic. Depending on where you're at, you have um, new, by now, hopefully, well, we're in August, so your residents, hopefully your interns should be somewhat acclimated to practicing a new environment. Many people will have medical students returning. Uh, we're going to have residency interviews starting. But a lot of folks, for various reasons in terms of just, for instance, quarantining, Many people have not gone on vacations. Uh, they've stayed quarantined. Many people, practicing physicians, have families, and you're in different state processes of whether your kids are going to be going to school, whether it's going to be online or a hybrid. Do you have any quick tips in terms of physician wellness that you care to impart on folks that they can think about in terms of navigating, um, if you will, the fall and what's, and I mean, I think it's just prudent to expect it. We're going to have some challenges because one, flu season is going to be on top of that. I mean, in, in inevitably, life is going to give us additional challenges, as we saw just with uh, Hurricane Laura, as an example. And may everybody, I want to say, in, who was affected by Hurricane Laura, I hope they're doing well by. But do you have any wellness tips for us, Dr. Yellow Lease? Sure. I mean, I think, um, I mean, uh, quite a number, obviously. I mean, the, uh, I mean, there actually is a lot of overlap with technology. Uh, yeah. I mean, one of, the, one of the beauties of technology that I think we've suddenly learned is that we can actually work more flexibly. Yeah. Um, and and that for you know for any parent is really mm -hmm. important to be able to work from home um, and look after the kids mm -hmm. uh, or to be able to uh, you know interact with your kids who may be away at college or something like that. Um, you know, I, I think we, I, I hope, and I think it, this is very likely, we're going to move away from the sort of official nine to five work week to a great extent. Um, and there's no reason at all why we shouldn't be working more flexible hours uh, um, using technologies. Um, we can do the same uh, in terms of where we're working. As you, you mentioned earlier on, the issue about, you know, do we need to keep our offices? Um, you know, I think we may need, we may be less tied to physical brick buildings in the mm. future, and we may be able to work more flexibly. Um, and, and I think both of those things are actually really good for our own well-being, um, because it gi they give us more control over our lives in a situation where we're losing control because of all the, the sort of weird things that are happening around us. Um, so I think, I think actually taking up technology and using it in an intelligent way, using, you know, best practices, not in any way suggesting you should reduce your clinical uh, efforts or your, your clinical standards. Um, but, uh, but I think using technologies in the best way possible is, is, is one really obvious way of, of uh, helping our own well-being. Um, I think the other thing that's really interesting is this whole issue of, uh, you know, we talk about social distancing. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, as, as you know, it's physical distancing and actual social connecting. Um, and, and I think we can use technology to keep ourselves socially connected. Um, so, for instance, I, I run a research team. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm actually having more meetings with them now than I used to have because they're all working from their homes. Mm -hmm. um, I have weekly meetings instead of what used to be sort of meetings every two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. We spend the first 10 or 15 minutes of every meeting just checking in with each other and making mm -hmm. sure everybody is okay. So I think we need to look at how we run our meetings and, and every meeting should probably start with a check-in going around, make sure everybody's fine. What have they been up to? Any interesting stories recently? Um, any great things that have happened in your lives? Any, any, any difficulties too? Um, and, and we've got to start changing the way that we, we think about some of our meetings and probably actually have less meetings than we used to have, but more useful meetings that are more, more focused personally. 
um, and our, you know, because now the business of, of medicine is suddenly it involves looking after healthcare workers. Yes. Um, and we've suddenly actually become more important in one respect. Okay. Um, you know, we're more important than the ventilators. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, and so we have to look after each other and, and a way of doing that is clearly to, uh, to work more effectively in teams. Uh, I think people in leadership positions need to think about this very carefully. How do they connect more with their teams? Um, and how do they um, respect the people they're working with and, and find out more about them and, uh, and make sure that they're okay at all times? So again, very different. So I, I think there's actually a lot of positive things that can come out of this, um, but we've really got to start thinking differently about how we, how we manage and lead um, uh, in, in, in this situation. Um, and we can't do it in the way that we used to do it. Okay. I think you, you're going to find, for instance, that, that great leaders in the future at a professional level and, and potentially at a national and, and other levels are going to be much more empathic people. I think it's actually very important to, to be empathic. Um, and I'm actually not making a, a deliberate political point here, but I actually think it's very important at all levels of society um, to, to, uh, to interact in that way and to do that more uh, in, in our daily meetings. Okay. Dr. Yellowlees, I couldn't agree with you more in regards to many of the tenets that you laid out in regards to wellness, particularly the idea of I kind of always had a thought, um, and I'm blanking on some of the excellent attendants who've taught this to me, but um, kind of what we do for our patients, we do for ourselves. So um, like if I recommend a CBT strategy, it's because I think it works and I practice it in my daily life. So if we're utilizing technology, that can be utilized to our benefit also. And I, again, as you painted the picture, um, I kind of think about leaning into it, embrace things with the technology that you wouldn't have normally been able to do, like say for instance, you can eat lunch at home with your your child, which I did before this, which I, I thought was um, great. The other thing that you, and I wanna close on the note because it was so powerful what you said, um, we need more empathy in general. Um, and this is, and it's not a political point. It's no. in general, this this country, we when we all are aware and understand each other, you know, when we can disagree in an agreeable, in, in a civil fashion, we're always at a, a greater strength. And that does require empathy and ability to listen to somebody else's point of view without anger. And again, that crosses any and all political and ideological divides, I would hope so. Dr. Yellow, uh, it's been a true pleasure uh, speaking with you. Um, I'm looking forward to hopefully speaking with you again when we are in uh, a little bit further along in uh, co this COVID-19 pandemic, and we can again further embrace um, where we're at in the practice of medicine and psychiatry uh, specifically. So thank you so very much, sir. Good, and it's been a real pleasure to, to talk to you, Dr. Norris, and to get to know you. And uh, congratulations for all the changes you've made as well. Well, thank you. And that's a wrap on episode 134 of the Sightcast by MD Edge. I am the voice of MD Edge podcasts, Nick Andrews. The Sightcast is produced by MD Edge editors Gina Henderson and Jeff Bauer. The show notes are written by Dr. Jacqueline Posada. This interview was hosted by the editor in chief of MD Edge Psychiatry, Dr. Lorenzo Norris. Our guest this week was Dr. Peter Yellowlees. All MDH podcasts are produced by MDH executive editor Kathy Scarbeck, as well as the senior vice president of editorial at Medscape, Dr. Ivan Oransky. I am the audio engineer and audio editor for this show. You're listening to the Sitecast by MDH.